Let's go back to that garden where God said, in the day you eat, you will die. Did they die die that day? No. No. God is not a liar, they say. So what God said, he did not mean what we've interpreted to mean. Already out the bat, right out the gate in Genesis, you already go, God said they would die when they ate and they get kicked out. They didn't die. So therefore, death does not mean what your eschatological model, Matt, you're suggesting the eschatology is trying to solve. It is not that solution. Most Christians that I'm aware of, especially in America and the world, believe that Jesus is coming back at some point in the future. He's going to make all things right, put an end to evil, suffering, death, no more tears, no more darkness, etc. There are certain groups of Christians who have recognized some things Jesus has said in the past um, may have been talking about the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. Oftentimes, these Christians are called partial preterists. I have explained this on live streams before. Maybe in the future, I'll do a video of its own, taking you through my journey of eschatology and how I ended up to where I am today, a non-believer. But as I'm diving into this, I want to point out there's a certain group before I hit my end in Christianity that took Jesus so, so far when he made statements about Some of you standing here will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his glory with his Father and his angels to repay each man according to their deeds, etc., etc. Or the end is going to happen soon. We see over and over, whether it be Revelation, in Paul's letters, in the Gospels, etc. When they saw that, they took it serious. But in doing so, some of the words and meanings of words have to take on an allegorical, metaphorical sense in order to have Jesus' words be true and that be reality to them. So they are called full preterist. And just to give you a highlight of some of the works, in case you're a full preterist watching, who doesn't think I know what full preterism is or you never really knew or understood it, there's several books I'd like to point out. This one right here was um, Sam Frost, who wrote an exegetical essays on 1 Corinthians 15 from a full preterist perspective. The Elements Shall Melt with Fervent Heat, Don K. Preston, who I would say is the leading proponent in the world right now online uh, for full preterism. I understand there are several voices, but debate-wise, he's the one on the front lines. Here is one by Timothy. Uh, it's uh, Timothy Martin, Tim Martin and J.L. Vaughn on covenant creation. And in this one, full preterism goes so far, they run into an issue in 2 Peter 3 where it talks about the elements melting with fervent heat and stuff. But remember the first heavens and earth were destroyed by a great watery deluge. And so they recognize, well, if we're gonna have Jesus's words be fulfilled, then the last or the heavens and earth they're living in now, if that's destroyed by fire, and that can't be cosmologically heaven and earth. It's got to be this temple. So they find a way to also go back and see the flood account might be talking about the first temple. And that waters might have represented nations. Notice how everything can mean other things. Because you can find somewhere in scripture where peoples are considered waters. Or peoples are called animals. Like look in Daniel, nations are called lions or certain beasts of animals are considered to be nations. We do it today. You'll find like a bear on a Russian flag or something or somewhere, right? Like an animal represents a nation. This still goes on. They go so far as to say Genesis creation had nothing to technically do with cosmology. In fact, they'll use some modern scholars to do that and show it's not ex nihilo, which They're on the right track, but a broken clock is right twice a day. Um, I'll make it quick. Hebrews fulfilled. Last days identified. Don K. Preston. This one is dispensationalism. Keith A. Matheson. Of course, he's arguing against dispensationalism, but from a full preterist point of view. In flaming fire. These are little pamphlets. Blast from the past. And time statements are the biggest thing that these people do. It's called realized eschatology is really what it is. Uh, have heaven and earth passed away? A study of five, Matthew 5, 17 through 18. 
Can God tell time? Notice it's always time related. How is this possible? Behold, I'm coming quickly. The resurrection of the dead. It's a debate. This book right here, Don K. Preston and James B. Jordan debate. He came as a thief. He did come. Jesus did return. 70 weeks are determined for the resurrection. This is Daniel. Man, they do some stuff. Uh, let me just tell you. Uh, the great controversy, past, present, future. How will it end? And I think this was written by an anonymous author who did not want their name on it. Um, Christianity's great dilemma. Is Jesus coming again or is he not? Glenn L. Hill. He's no longer with us. Um, another Don K. Preston. Like father, like son. On the clouds of glory. You know, because Yahweh came on the clouds several times in the Old Testament. Read in the Psalms. He came, yea, he gave his voice, and he had arrows of thunder and lightning and the bows and nostrils breathing fire riding on the cherub he did on the clouds he came. Like, in all of that symbolic metaphorical language, that's how Jesus came, meaning he didn't literally come. There was no evidence of him coming, but the evidence was the destruction of God's own people in Jerusalem. That was the resurrection, the final judgment, the climatic everything happened when God slaughtered his chosen people in his temple. Hmm. Great ending there, my friends. I actually hook, line, and sinker bought it. Sorry for the long introduction. R.C. Sproul was a stepping stone in the process. Last days, according to Jesus, who is this Babylon? Don K. Preston, of course, he wants to argue this is Jerusalem, which is nonsense. And then about preterism, Roderick Edwards. Now, this is not a full preterist. He argues against full preterism. I just wanted to show that, if you don't mind, Matt, to give everybody a little teaser to say, I was one. I know what it's like. I even went up to Blue Point Bible Church, gave my testimony as a preterist. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And also gave like a lecture on why I believed you had Elijah you had Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration, which was the law and the prophets being summed up in the Son of God, who is here on this mountain gloriously shining like light, that this was the climatic time in history where the end of all ages has come. And it was it was like, it was, amen, hallelujah. Everybody was like, yes, confirmation. Jesus came and he kept his damn word. So we, we found ways. And we found little weird things like the Hymenaeus and Philetus teaching that the, the resurrection had already happened in the past or what you've mentioned before about first corinthians the people the corinthians or or, or the Thessalon thessalonians like there's weird realized eschatology stuff that does show up the gospel of thomas when will the repose of the dead be lord and he says look around you can't see it but it's already happened the resurrection has already happened that's why I don't understand why they don't just call themselves Gnostics. Anywho, let's have some fun. Yeah, Stephen. I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation. Uh, so I never went as full as you did into like full preterism, um, but I did go, I, I was on the road there and I, I went, you know, more the N.T. Wright style of partial preterism, but you, you end up making a lot of the same hermeneutical moves, um, just, just didn't go quite as far. Um, but for me, you know, in retrospect, looking back on it, the thing that is most fascinating to me about full preterism uh, is looking at it sociologically um, because of my interest in cognitive dissonance and looking at the, the literature on cognitive dissonance in messianic and apocalyptic movements throughout history, movements that believe and claim and prophesy that the end is coming soon. And then when that doesn't happen, there's a few different routes you can go with it. And there's usually different factions in these groups that end up going in different directions. Some of them, you know, redate the prophecy and push it into the future. And so they take more of the futurist route. And then some of them uh, reinterpret the content of the prophecy um, so that it refers to something that did happen, but the, it's been reinterpreted so that, oh, the thing that we, we expected to happen, we expected it to happen, you know, physically, but actually it happened spiritually. Um, and so they spiritualize it and turn it into metaphor and so forth. And um, they do their hermeneutical work that way. Um, and so that's more in the preterist direction. But in kind of getting into the weeds of a lot of those movements, you realize that, you know, the, they're, they're, 
in the initial days and weeks and months and years following the failure of their expectation, it's usually pretty messy. And there's some, some groups that go fully into just redating and just pushing it into the future. And so they go a fully futurist route. And then there are some who go in an extreme uh, kind of what uh, uh, some sociologists looking at like 19th century movements like the Jehovah's Witnesses or um, the Seventh-day Adventists like to call a whole movement they call ultraism. Um, but it was an overly realized eschatology that um, believed that everything has already happened. And what we expected to happen in 1844 did happen. And Jesus has fully come and we're in the kingdom now. And so they went in a full preterist direction. But what's interesting is how the the fully futurist direction and the fully preterist direction don't seem to have as much stickiness to them. They don't uh, usually get as many adherents as having a kind of already but not yet mixture of the two. The the rationalizations that usually get the most steam and gain the most followers is having a a kind of partial fulfillment explanation where you spiritualize the the prediction so that it happened, but it happened partially and it is meant to then confirm and anticipate the full expectation that we still hold on to that's going to happen in the very near future. And so in doing that, you, you, you kind of have your cake and eat it too by having, you're able to hold on to the core of your hope that drove that original eschatological expectation, which is a hope grounded in the defeat of evil. It's the restoration of creation. It's the resurrection of the dead. It's that all of the wrong things and all of the evil that we see in the world will be made right. God will win and everything will be made right. If you go in the full preterist direction, you kind of relinquish that hope and, and, and the, 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 the original drive of eschatology, you give it up. Um, but if you go in the full futurist direction, then you kind of have to give up the expect, the near expectation that the, that you had when you, you said, Oh, it's coming soon. It's coming soon. You have to give that up. And so, uh, by, by, having an already but not yet kind of middle ground approach, um, you get to hold on to the original expectation that is the defeat of evil, that answer to the problem of evil. But then you also get to maintain your belief in the original prediction that it was going to happen soon and say it did happen in a way and we just misunderstood. Um, and so you can see how that that kind of uh, middle road approach uh is able to gather the most adherence. And again and again in these kinds of movements that find rationalizations, you see that debate happening after the failure of a prediction. There is those who go the more full preterist route. There's more who those, those who go the full futurist route. And usually there's a, the, the kind of dialectic between the two creates a more middle ground approach that becomes the, the 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 orthodoxy or the mainstream that the future generations usually hold on to. But full preterism is a fascinating sociological phenomenon to me, looking at it from the cognitive dissonance perspective, because it is this group of people who are so focused on the timing predictions that they're willing to give up everything else in order to justify Jesus, to get Jesus off the hook and to get the biblical authors off the hook for the the, the soon predictions, um, even to the extent of giving up what is, I think, the ultimate goal of eschatology in the first place. And that's the as being an answer to the problem of evil. But. Yes. One of the first things that when I was going from a partial preterist point of view that they get you on is first of all as a christian i was like well if jesus says it i have to believe it okay jesus says it i have to believe it and this is where they get you because they're right about this so let me i my intro told me this is nonsense that's nonsense or this and that listen they're right about some things okay did you know that <laughs> did you know that people can be right about some things but they're really right about something that futurists ignore often and that is the time statements. There are some things Jesus said that was supposed to happen, and it was supposed to happen within time. 
that, like not far from his time or whoever the authors are of these books that are saying Jesus said, these gospels. Paul, some of us standing here, you know, like uh, we who remain and are alive at his coming. Okay. Paul expects that in his life. We full preterist do not shy away from that. Yeah. That's the thing because it's obvious it's there. Then they change the meaning of things, I would say, but I did not think, I thought that that maybe the full preterist understood those other things in their proper context because that's what they do. They start to then go, and let me, let me take you back. So now you're sold on Jesus said some things and he said some things that were expected because it's like, you never really thought of them that way. And you go, wow, he did mean like soon and these things were supposed to happen so near. Cultural, historical context. They talk about what was the authorial intent. They want to get into that. And they're right. There's some good stuff there. Then they go, let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to that garden where God said, in the day you eat, you will die. Did they die, did they die that day? No. no. God is not a liar, they say. So what God said, he did not mean what we've interpreted it to mean. Already out the bat, right out the gate in Genesis, you already go, God said they would die when they ate and they get kicked out. They didn't die. So therefore, death does not mean what your eschatological model, Matt, you're suggesting the eschatology is trying to solve. It is not that solution. Yeah. So when you get to the end of the book, because they think it's all one harmonious canon like I did as a Christian, you see there will be no more death. There will be no more tears and no more sorrow. All of this, and they interpret the Genesis 1 scenario, Don K. Preston, especially covenant creationists that I was reading about how they do this, they say this is about the law. It's about, spiritual. it's about spiritual covenantal death. It's about covenantal death with their covenant relationship to their God and being cut off meant you were dead, not literal death. Literal death never mattered. And in fact, they could then find themselves actually being like, you mean there was death before Adam? Some of them can go, they can go old earth creationists. They could say evolution's true if they want, whatever. It opens that door. And it's like, oh, I can be sophisticated while doing this if they want. Most of them are fundamentalists though in their approach. But when they're looking at that, death is not the problem in what we think of death. Death is the cutoff of being not part of the covenant. And then it's like, once you see that in their view and you can willingly grab and go, yeah, maybe death didn't mean what we think it means. It means covenantal death. Then they find passages where Moses speaks to Israel. He's speaking to Israel, the context says. And then he says, give your ears, O heavens, and listen. Oh, earth. Okay. So they interpret that heavens and earth as a phrase together to mean the covenant people and the covenant relationship between those people and God. When I talk to the Hebrew scholars today, they say heavens is where the gods dwelled, the council of the deities. This is not how full preterists interpret this. I want the original. This is why I'm not a full preterist anymore, by the way. I'm giving you the key. If you're listening, full preterist friends, I'm giving you the key, the answer to what real academics are saying, not what your, your harmonious Christian pastors who are full preterists are trying to teach you. Heavens and earth are cosmological locations. They are literal geographical locations. He's not using just a phrase they coined to go, oh, heaven and earth. Yeah, we're talking about Israel. Okay. We're talking about the gods above and the mortals below. Listen, give your ears, O oh gods, and you mortals, you humans, specifically the Israelites who are listening. They say, oh, it's all just God's covenant people. So now when we get later on, when he says, heaven and earth will pass away, this old covenant, they equate and interpret, will pass away. But my words will stand forever. So Jesus' words will be forever, but that old covenant, those Jewish old covenant, yeah, that's about to pass away with the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. Every model gets interpreted. Second Peter 3, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, stoichiai. Now, we know philosophically speaking, these were Middle Platonist and um, uh, Stoics at this time. Paul's working within that. I have several academics. I did not know this is a full preterist. We did not think within material philosophy type sense. And that's what Paul's doing. Second Peter 3. 
3 is very stoic in it, Second Peter 3 and its description of the elements melting with fervent heat and all of that is like straight up stoicism. So Right. Yeah. And I, I just want to add this and then I want to hand you the mic, but I'm giving them the ammunition to really investigate the full preterist who go, why are you not a full preterist? Don't you see it? My full preterist friends, I get it. Jesus made some claims about time and when and all these things. And so did Paul. 100% full preterist taught me that. I was like, dude, they're on the money. But did they happen? Is it fulfilled? Well, of course, the realized eschatology will spiritualize or even say, well, it's the temple. So the melting elements are not the stoichia of the universe, the cosmos. It's actually the cosmos of the Jewish religious practice and the inner sanctuary that had the, 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 the menorah and all of that stuff's what melted. And you want proof of it? Read Josephus. He even saw the armies in the clouds, etc. So they, they find a way to make everything interpreted through that model. But when you go to the original Genesis context, what is Genesis actually saying? That they would actually die, mortals. They would literally die in the physical sense. And that's why he kicks them out of the garden to not eat from the tree of life. So they won't live physically forever and keep reproducing children in the garden. This is the reason the gods, and I'll say gods because it says, let us make man in our image, plural, even though there's a chief deity in mind, in my opinion, it's very Mesopotamian. So, you know, there's so many things. I'm kind of correcting while I'm trying to steal man and explain along the way, but feel free to take us wherever you want. No, I think, I think you, you put your finger on the, the hermeneutical ploy that they, that they go for is that it's this, you know, kind of principle of scripture interpreting scripture, um, where it's okay. If, if you say that, you know, scripture interprets scripture, you take a canonical approach, you take a, an inherently harmonistic approach where because the word of God can't be wrong. Um, and that's these 66 books, then you kind of use them uh, already. You're, you're setting them up as a kind of puzzle piece where you, uh, anything that doesn't fit your, uh, your interpretation, you can find another passage in another book somewhere else that is using language in a different way because it's a different author and they're using language in different ways, but you can then, superimpose that on the problem passage that you have and help it to reinterpret that passage. But that's why it's so important to read stuff historically in its own context, read each book of the Bible as a book, because the Bible is not a book. The Bible is an anthology of books and letters and fragments of books from uh, with many different genres across wide stretch of both time and geography. Um, and they carry very different views. But obviously, if you have the, the presupposition that they they all just express God's truth and they can't God can't lie and it has to all connect perfectly together with no contradictions, then you've already set yourself up to misinterpret and twist what the individual authors are saying. Um, but to kind of throw them a bone, I still believe, I mean, it's some of the arguments that N.T. Wright uh, likes to make. It's usually going back to the older prophets, um, which when you're reading the older prophets, you're reading people who uh, the extent of their concern was for the nation. And they really didn't have any conception of an afterlife. The vast majority of the Hebrew Bible of the Old Testament doesn't really have any vision for life after death, um, doesn't have any vision for resurrection. And so the extent, the, the kind of the upper reaches of its eschatology, insofar as it even has an eschatology, is pretty limited. It's about the nation prospering. And the nation being judged. And so all of the prophecies, when you're reading, let's say Isaiah, you know, and Isaiah 13 talks about the judgment of Babylon and it uses cosmic language about the stars falling from heaven and so forth. Isaiah 34 is the same, same, uh, same kind of language, um, but uses, you know, what we call cosmic disturbance, cosmic dis catastrophe language to describe the judgment of nations. And that's a place then where you say, oh, well, mm, that's metaphorical. Um, so you go to the New Testament, you go to the words of Jesus, and that's you awesome. go to Revelation and where you see cosmic catastrophe language that is being pulled from those older prophets, you say, well, scripture interpreting scripture, 
they must be using it in the same way. It's metaphorical. It's not talking about the end of creation or Second Peter 3 isn't talking about the elements literally melting with fervent heat. It's all metaphorical. The problem with that is that you're jumping hundreds of years through different genres and what you're missing is the development of, of apocalyptic literature. And when we read these texts historically, we see a number of developments. And I think resurrection, the development of the belief in resurrection is a really good example of the kind of development that we have where if you read an older prophet like Ezekiel, Ezekiel talks about resurrection, but it's metaphorical not for literal bones, you know, coming out of the graves and flesh being put on them and everything. It's uh, Ezekiel 37. This, this image where Ezekiel has a vision of these dry bones coming up out of the ground and it's a resurrection, but it's clear from the context that what Ezekiel is talking about, it's, it's a symbolic vision for the restoration of the nation of Israel. And like all Ezekiel's contemporaries, he didn't actually have any conception of physical resurrection of individuals. What mattered was the prosperity of the nation. That was the ultimate end in his mind. Um, but after Ezekiel, with the development of apocalyptic literature, with the book of Daniel especially, we begin to see this shift into the belief in personal resurrection, where Daniel is being faced, the author of Daniel in the second century BC is uh, surrounded by um, the Seleucid Empire, all of this persecution of his contemporaries, the, the Maccabean revolt, etc. And the wise, Daniel, the, the authors of Daniel, the community that he's a part of, um, they're dying. And he's made all of these promises that they would inherit the the kingdom and that the temple would be restored and that uh the the angel michael would come and wage war on their behalf and and yet they're dying so what gives how can how can you know with this delay and these promises that we've made how can these faithful israelites enjoy the promises the answer is that they're going to be they're going to be resurrected and he takes the language from his tradition and he literalizes it and he begins he it's the first example that we have in first clear an indisputable example is is daniel 12 2 where he talks about the dead being raised and receiving uh, uh eternal life and the wicked uh receiving judgment uh and eternal shame and contempt um but it's it's a it's a final judgment scene um and then into the new testament they carry that apocalyptic belief in literal resurrection and if you're going to then you know look at that literal resurrection belief in the new testament and you know make an argument f from ezekiel 37 that because ezekiel uses that language metaphorically you can then kind of cut and paste that onto the new testament and argue against literal resurrection it's just that's not how we read texts you have to see that these things develop. And the same thing goes with the cosmic catastrophe language. Apocalyptic literature, unlike earlier prophetic literature, does begin to think cosmically. It begins to think of the actual destruction and restoration of the material world and not just the prosperity or judgment of specific nations uh, within the world they begin to think about the entire world as as a thing um and and you got to recognize those developments if you're actually going to read these texts within their own historical context and be interested in what the authors are saying and what they mean in those contexts instead of just thinking harmonistically amen you hit the nail on the head. Um, so many things you said that are just really, really good to point out. Yes, they will absolutely, full preterist will absolutely show that what looks to be apocalyptic metaphorical, they'll say it looks apocalyptic because it's so, you know, the, the mountains will melt and the stars will fall. And what is it describing? The destruction of Babylon or the destruction of uh, Syria or whatever it might be. Um, it has this language. And you have spoke briefly about how um, Robert Carroll may think that in those situations, some of the Jews may have even thought this was really the end, um, but redactors may have come in and polished it up and said, okay, hold up, hold up. So it's a metaphor for what happened to this nation. But after Plato 
and when you know you have Alexander the Great that really brings Hellenism to the world, which would include the philosophy of the Greeks, which has these layers of of from staunch materialism where we're at kind of our lowest form to the highest level of like pure, I guess you would say ether almost like the highest uh, spiritual pneuma level where there is no material necessarily like what we have. It's a different kind of thing that can go all the way up. Um, this material cosmos, the, the elements um, will melt, right? We, we see this. That is a problem. Paul constantly discusses flesh. I know that that gets interpreted through full preterist lens of like law. And they, they want to say like flesh is law and law is this bad thing. So it's like got a protestant kind of thing to it as well, rather than seeing it as like, no, this probably even is like a dispute between other law type factions of Jews and his version of the law of Christ, which is not the same kind of law. So we have like this weird diaspora dispute probably happening amongst Paul and other Jewish sects. It's not like anti-Torah to the point of like, have nothing to do with it. No, he talks about it being a, a teacher, um, not a bad thing. Long story short though, what I thought what you did was great is pointing out how they hermeneutically leap and they overwhelmingly reference the Hebrew scripture as an interpretive model for the new. So they, they jump to Isaiah says, and Micah says, and Hosea says, and such and such says, and this is the same problem with a splinter sect from full preterism called Israel only. This group goes even further. And you've probably never even heard of this group, but just to whet your appetite, they believe the end happened in 70. That most of them don't believe at all anymore. Most of them, they believe that the Gentiles, the nations, that term shouldn't be Gentiles. They don't like that. They don't like Goyim or, or Gentiles to mean non-Israelites. They'll say it means non-Jews, but Jews only encompass the Southern tribes. These nations were the 10 Northern lost Israelites, the tribes of the Israelites. So the gathering of the lost Israelites needed to come in before the end. They interpret this model that the Goyim, the ethne, the, the nations are actually the diaspora from the Assyrian conquest where the Northern Israel was destroyed and they were scattered among the nations of the earth. That, that Paul's mission is to save the lost Israelites. And that's who these people are. And they're bringing them in. Th there's no end to how full preterism will, will go at any length to make these things hermeneutically and theologically make sense. But back to full preterism, just the basic forms of it that is the majority view, like they aren't realizing how much recontextualization is taking place in the New Testament when it's quoting. There is Christopher D. Stanley, who I think is the leading guy on this. He, he talks about Paul's misuse of scripture and it's misuse if we're reading it as if Paul means what he's quoting. He never means, literally never, in any reference he ever quotes, take me to task on this. Go watch my videos on this with Christopher D. Stanley. There's not a single reference where Paul quotes the Hebrew scriptures and he means exactly what the context says in the Hebrew scriptures, never. Oftentimes, you, if you had Paul's, like, imagine we didn't have the Hebrew scriptures and we discovered them one day and we were like reading Paul, we would think that, for example, you shall not muzzle an ox. And I mentioned this yesterday, right? You would think, okay, hold on. Maybe the law is actually a spiritual lesson about the apostles, but it's foretold and foreshadowed. We go to read that in the in original context. These guys really worried about cattle and really cared about how the animal abuse was taking place or how you should treat your animals because they were agricultural. They were trying to survive. They never had in mind these future apostles that are running around. Pay those guys. Yeah, you got to pay them, man. So the way Paul uses scripture is not what it originally meant. That's not even getting into what you said, Matt, because what you said is like, yeah, I agree with you, Derek. I, there's this recontextualization and they're using it as if it's a living document to their own means and purposes. But by the time of the first century, if we use a heuristic approach, comparing apocalyptic literature as John J. Collins and others have, you have a cosmic end of human history expectation taking place. And the language is very similar to what we're finding in, in Paul in the New Testament in the Gospels. Yet we're supposed to run and say this all means metaphorical or all is some like corporate spiritual thing. When all of the Jewish literature around there, Second Temple literature, late Second Temple literature, is saying this stuff with the same thing in mind. So 
like it's it's again a special pleading kind of thing like oh but this doesn't mean that because this is true rather than well what did jews think and that's why Schweitzer and others who came in and said we need to set this text within jewish context at least to try and see what did jews think what were jews expecting they weren't thinking in Ezekiel of like just nationalistic corporate, some metaphor to ex describe our nation never ending. And one of the views Don K. Preston, leading guy has is corporate body view. And there's others who have individual body view. All right. So he thinks the resurrection is the corporate body of Christ is some spiritual bride. And like, it's not individualistic. Whereas the individual body view of full preterists say, when you die to be absent from the Lord is to be present. Or to be absent for the bodies, be present with the Lord. And they think when you die, you then face judgment and stuff like that. So there's different forms of it and they aren't in agreement in full preterism because the New Testament isn't in agreement. I'm done rambling. Your turn. <laughs> no, I, I don't have anything to anything to say in response to that. But I mean, it's just as with any kind of apologetic approach to the Bible or anything, it's just, you know, if you're going to think historically, you cannot be an apologist because it, it, it is corrosive to the aims of trying to think historically about any text. You have your interest first and foremost has to be what is this author saying in this context at this time and place? And you have to be devoted to that and that only. If you're also devoted to agreeing with them, if you're if you if you have a prior commitment that what they say must be true and it must agree with all of these 65 other books, um, then you, you're, you at least have to recognize the potential that you are going to be twisting what that author is saying in order to fit it with those other authors or vice versa. And that's not how you do interpretation of anything. That is not the way to go. Don't, don't be an apologist because you're going to find yourself doing exactly the kinds of things that full preterists do um, and go just bending yourself into the craziest knots in order to try and come out the other side and say Jesus wasn't wrong. Um, yeah. I got a couple examples, couple examples, and then we'll wrap up. But first thing is in the Acts 1 Ascension narrative, several academics who are in New Testament scholarship who aren't as critical as the scholars I like the most, um, try to find Jewish precedents for this, for these narratives we find. And I get it. It's easy to find it is written. So if it's written, you know, they're using scripture. So they only want to look there instead of the larger zeitgeist of the world in which this literature is in. And it's all written in Greek, mind you. So you're like, all right, you're already dealing with people who are in a Greek culture with a Greek writing style with Greek literature screw the fact that there's all this other Greek literature. We need to focus on only the Greek book of the LXX. Get out of my face with that. Okay. So Allison agreed just to get in one point about the Romulus connection. Well, I, I just want to highlight that for everybody who's watching that might be full preterist, who's never heard that the ascension of Jesus in Acts 1-8 is actually a Romulus kind of retelling, but Jesus is greater than Romulus. And there's more witnesses there, not just one. So they're watching him go up. They see him with their eyeballs leave. There's a term there, and I don't know the Greek word off the top of my head, but it's in like manner, you will see him come back. What do they do? They find this Greek term being used in Matthew 23. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks. See, in like manner doesn't mean literal, and, and it's just silly. So I want you to comment just briefly on that, of course, and then I want to run to Revelation. No, I mean, it's it's... Without even getting into the Greek, you can see how ridiculous that is, because if you just use the word like, you can see from different contexts in Acts 1, you know, in like manner, just as he ascended, he will also descend. You can see that that the use of the word like there is not being used in the sense of metaphor or a simile, but is saying in the same way that he left, he will also return read Matthew 23, how I wanted to gather you like a mother hen gather. It's clear that that is a simile context, context, context. Like you can't just be jumping around and saying, because a word is used this way in one place in this context means it must be used in that way in every other place. That's not how we do interpretation. That's not how we do. That's not how etymology works. Like it's like me saying, you know, if, if, uh, if I said, you know, the, if I use the word gay, 
And you say, well, you know, if you go back a hundred years, the way people use the word gay in literature a hundred years ago, it meant happy. And therefore I must be just saying I'm happy. And it's like, well, no, time and place matters. Context matters. Etymology matters. You can't just jump around like that and say, because a word hundreds of years ago was used in one way or in a different time and place, it was used in one way. It must be used that way in another place. That's not how language works. And it's important noting it's a different author, of course, they're going to. So I know they think scripture is living, so they'll come up with any way. But getting to Revelation and just to highlight one of the things that really made me go, what? Even today, this is a weird thing. Follow me on this one. This one's really weird. Many ex-Christians who have deconverted, who no longer believe, who were full preterists in the same camp as me, same tribe, did the same things and look and saw the same arguments that I did and all of that, cannot get out of it. And what I mean is they no longer believe and they still think the best interpretation of scripture is full preterism. That they still think revelation is all about ba uh, Babylon being Jerusalem. They still haven't exited that understanding of scripture even though they no longer believe it. And it's shocking to me because it's like, once I left, I wanted to scrutinize and pick apart even the thing that was kind of a catalyst to leading me in this direction that led me down a path of my own deconstruction. The other night, you're the first person who ever nailed it, seeing how I started seeing language and words can have layers of meaning and things because you see what happens when you can interpret things in various ways. Um, but I started to, to notice that and I was like, what? So even today on Myth Vision, when I post something that's talking about Revelation 17, the city on the seven hills, and this whore of Babylon, like I'll say stuff, dude, I don't think you can get any clearer on who this is as Rome, and they think it's Jerusalem. We know the seven-hilled city was ubiquitously understood in this literature in this historical context and setting all over as Rome. There's no other city in the world, in the known world, not, you can't go to China and find something like this, okay? And it is Rome. And it not only is Rome, it's the second Babylon, the whore of Babylon. All you, it's like almost common sense. Who destroyed Jerusalem the first time? Babylon. Who destroyed Jerusalem the second time? Jerusalem destroyed Jerusalem? That's the logic that they're almost insisting on. Well, the leadership within Jerusalem caused the destruction of Jerusalem. They may have in, in some way, but that's a weird logic to not realize. Rome came in and crushed Jerusalem. And there's other things in that same context that they ruled over the kings of the earth. Jerusalem ruled Jack Diddley squat. They also had a lot of merchant. They had a lot of, a lot of, uh, Rome was obviously the one who was in charge of the influx of all of these things that get listed in Revelation. Now, where they get you is they go, it's the kind of the Kenneth Gentry, Gary DeMar Revelation interpretation of pre-70 AD. And they want you to realize this is all pre-70. Go measure. Here's the measuring rod to measure the temple. The temple must have been standing as if the visionary experience given to one of the prophets of the Old Testament to go measure the temple. This is a heavenly sanctuary. It's not even an earthly one. But Revelation 11 talks about the city where our Lord was, was crucified called Sodom. Not called Babylon, called Sodom. I think that's Jerusalem. I have no problem with seeing both play a role in this, but it makes zero sense to make this all about Jerusalem then have this weird mark of the beast representing Nero. Who is he? Like the emperor of Rome? It's really, really odd. So there's, I had to swallow this pill after leaving full preterism and becoming a non-Christian and go, Revelation is actually about Rome, mostly. And, and those who cooperate with her, who fornicate with her. Yeah. yeah. You know, who else had to swallow that pill is N.T. Wright. Um, he, it's one of the few things that I've actually seen him change his mind on, uh, uh, over the years. He used to and has written a lot on Babylon in Revelation 17 being Jerusalem. Um, but he had to face the facts on it and he changed his mind a number of years and, and was like, no, it's, it's Rome. It's Rome. So full preterist needs to take a page from that. And, uh, I mean, he, he is the most credible 
person uh, who scholar who argues in their direction at times. Um, but he had to bite the bullet on that and realize, no, 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 no. it's Babylon, the harlot in Revelation 17. It's you, you can't argue it's it's Rome for sure. And one more thing, and we'll end this, is how they reinterpret things. Like Daniel, in Jewish literature, after Daniel, many Jews start to incorporate that kingdom at the feet that gets crushed by the rock as Rome. Originally, this was Greece. Uh, this, this did not have Rome in mind. So it's like a rolling idea through history that, like we do today, there's a way in which the Protestants didn't want I mean, Martin Luther didn't think Revelation was part of Scripture. Next thing you know, he realized, look at what the Pope's doing to me. Oh, you know what? I know who these people are. It's the Roman Catholic Church. So the the interpretation keeps continuing and it keeps incorporating, incorporating the modern contemporary thing because it's still alive, probably cognitive dissonance in some way. And the fact that the Jews are still holding on to Daniel and using the modern Roman empire when Daniel's writing, he's not dealing with that. He's dealing with Seleucids. He's dealing with other people. These aren't Rome. Rome is not the feat. And John J. Collins writes this in his commentary, but we see Jews later interpret Daniel as Rome. And this is what I'm trying to say about revelation. It's like, come on, get with the program, but full preterists want to act like it's Jerusalem. And they, it, I can't help but think, my final thing on that is that it's almost inherently anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish, not realizing its tendencies. You want to save the Savior so much that the climatic part of history, the best part of history, is when God destroys his own people, according to the perception. And there's a part where it says there will be great tribulation, none ever that has come before or ever since then. And when you bring up the Holocaust, which is far more people dying in way worse situations in many ways, um, maybe I, I'm not going to say way worse. Okay. It could have been just as bad. There was cannibalism going on in the temple when they were kept in by the Romans, et cetera. It was bad. No matter what, it was ugly, both horrible, but way more Jews died. Some of the full preterists will go so far as to say those aren't real Jews. So now they get into this whole, it goes into this Ashkenazi thing. It gets lost into conspiracy theories. It's, well, God took his people away, so they aren't real Jews. You see the tendency for anti-Semitism that rises from this. Yeah. No, anti-Semitism, like, it is for sure, it goes in that direction. Um, but uh, also, I think the point that you just made about um, the way that apocalyptic literature like Revelation and like... Uh, 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 fourth Ezra, second Baruch, the Enoch literature, the way that it reinterprets Daniel. I think it's important to, to register how the New Testament and even how you were talking about Paul and the way that he's never quoting the Old Testament in its own context. He's constantly reinterpreting it. And that was, that was normal practice. Yeah. Um, Paul wasn't doing anything unusual in that time and place, but I think it's important to register just how the 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 reinterpretive strategies of the new testament and of apocalyptic literature to uh, to revive previous prophetic texts that failed um and to keep them alive to keep daniel alive to to project it into the future or to say that it's been fulfilled in whatever but to find a way to maintain faith um is constantly giving them new tools in their toolbox because they they, it, they create a culture of dissonance reduction that is giving different different rationalizations, different strategies for whichever direction you want to take anything. So the futurists get tons of ammo from the New Testament itself, from the Hebrew Bible itself, in order to make their arguments. Preterists get there's tons of ammo from the book of Revelation. I mean, even as we were just talking about book, the book of Revelation and the way that it, it's apocalyptic literature is so obscure and it's talking about Babylon and we're arguing about whether Babylon is Rome or Jerusalem. And it's, it's, so it's already metaphorical. It is, it's not Babylon, it's something else and it's speaking symbolically. Um, but the way that apocalyptic literature functions like that is already giving ammunition to people to hedge to reinterpret, to double down when it doesn't happen like they hoped it would 
it it enables them to maintain faith and to reinterpret it. And so uh, I think recognizing that and seeing the way that uh, the full preterists, what they're doing and the extremes that they're going to, they do have precedent in the Bible itself for that kind of hermeneutical work that they're doing. Um, they're just taking it to extremes and a kind of logical consistency that is just laser focused on this one hermeneutical route um, that is, uh, is you know, there are other routes that the, the New Testament and apocalyptic literature, uh, apocalyptic literature goes in in addition to that. But this is why I think cognitive dissonance is so important to understand because it explains all of that hermeneutical activity and it shows the what what is driving that, the engine of self-justification, the engine of trying to maintain faith in the thing that didn't that didn't actually that that what that wasn't fulfilled um that uh, there are cracks showing and you have to recover it um what do you do do you just walk away no you rationalize and that's what it is but.